Zechariah chapter 10. In the last couple of chapters, we've seen the word of the Lord through Zechariah to the people. And we'll see, uh, we have seen the word of God through Zechariah to the people really focus on God's continuing promise to bless and restore his people in his land and in his kingdom in the future. Last time in chapter 9 in particular, the Lord promised his people that he would defend them against a future army. Uh, That army would conquer neighboring kingdoms, we saw, but that army would also pass by Israel and Jerusalem. We talked about uh, how that army uh, came later on in the form of the Greeks under Alexander the Great and the fulfillment of that. And indeed, Jerusalem in history at that time was untouched uh, by that great conqueror. And then God's prophetic word shifted to foretelling of the coming of Israel's king, riding on a donkey and having salvation. And his kingdom will be marked by peace on earth, and he will have dominion that is over the whole earth, that prophecy said. And we know Jesus fulfilled that when he came the first time in peace, with salvation, even doing the very act of riding on the donkey on the appointed day and in the appointed way. And upon Jesus' return to the earth, then we will see this kingdom with dominion over all the earth, with peace as he rules exactly as it's been foretold. God then promised to rescue and strengthen his people against the Greeks again in time to come. And the successful Maccabean revolt uh, was a good fit for fulfilling that prophecy a few hundred years after the time of Zechariah. That was a time where they were facing a a superior army, but the, the rebels in Israel were victorious as God had promised he would make them. In chapter 10 tonight, The Lord will continue to give Zechariah words of great encouragement and promise for his people, namely words of promise for their restoration and all that God himself will do to bring it about, his provision to bring that about, his protection, his strength, his regathering, his continually promised regathering of his people in the land. And in chapter 11, though, we will see a prophecy of judgment against Israel in time to come, particularly judgment against bad leaders, pictured in Zechariah 11 and in many other places as bad shepherds. With the prophecy in in Zechariah 11 ending with the Lord also saying that there is a particular bad leader who will rise and afflict God's people greatly in time to come. But in the end, woe unto that man. So Zechariah 10 for tonight begins in verse 1, and it says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Now, while most of this chapter is about Israel's promised restoration, as we already said, we do have a rebuke and a warning here in the first few verses of this chapter. The rebuke starts here as the Lord calls for his people to call on him to depend on him, to trust in him, to expect him to do the things that he has promised to do. And specifically, it's for a particular condition or a particular event. And it is for the latter rain. Now, remember that the latter rain is what ensures a good harvest. The early rain makes the ground as fertile and ready to receive the seed and begin the germination process as it can be made. We mentioned that on Sunday. But that latter rain is what makes or breaks the harvest. The latter rain brings the grain to being ripe and ready. So you got a good latter rain, you got a good harvest. You got a good harvest, you have enough food to last you until you get to do it again next season. So the latter rain is crucial. And God says that in the promise to bring that, it says he's the one who brings the flashing clouds. He's the one who is going to bring the showers of rain. And he is the one who's going to bring and provide grass in the field for everyone. Now, in harvest terms, uh, grass is understood to mean certainly actual grass. That's important for your herds, but also grain for the people. And so this abundant harvest is promised and pictured here. So who should the people of God be calling on and depending on for that? Verse 1 makes it very plain. They should be calling on their God. They should be calling on the Lord for that. And so with that, then, now here is the rest of the rebuke. Verse 2. For the idols speak delusion. The diviners envision lies. 
and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. And so we see that the Lord is not here recounting their past through Zechariah. He is warning of their current errors and the current danger of idolatry, the same mistakes that they had made, that their forefathers, I should say, had made with idolatry and pagan practices and the turning their backs against the God of Israel, their God, the God. The people of Israel had taken to having household idols like the pagans, just like their forefathers had. And they had taken to consulting diviners to give them spiritual guidance from fake idols. But their words and their comfort, this says, God says, all of their words and their comfort is empty, it's vain, it's useless. They cannot bring about the rain and the harvest that you're asking them to. Instead, ask God, depend on him for it. But in their idolatry, the people wander off spiritually. And without godly leadership, which is mentioned here, without a good shepherd to lead them in the things of the Lord, the people are certainly in trouble. Just as they were before when God used the same language in times prior. The same language through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, warning in all through all three of those prophets of bad shepherds, bad leaders. And so again, does God use the same imagery, the same wording with the same warning through the prophet Zechariah? And so a rebuke against walking back into idolatry. Do not walk back into that place that your forefathers did. You know full well what happened to them. Don't walk back into that place. Ask God. Not only for the latter rain, but ask God as he is your God for all of the things that you do truly need. So this rebuke against walking back into idolatry with the warning of the self-inflicted trouble that idolatry always brings. It did before, it will again. If you walk in it, it brings you trouble. Verse 3, my anger is kindled against the shepherds and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. From him comes the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler together. They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. Without any particular details, the Lord promises now in these verses judgment upon those bad shepherds. That's the the first couple lines there. My anger is kindled against the shepherds. I will punish the goat herds. And so again, not much detail there, but still the promise of judgment against bad leaders, ungodly leaders who are leading the people not to the Lord or in God's ways, but instead away. Idolatrous spiritual leaders leading the people astray again. In contrast, the Lord promises at the middle of verse 3 there, he promises to visit his flock. He promises to judge and punish the bad leaders, but he promises to visit his flock. He promises to raise up from the house of Judah the kind of leadership that they need. This godly leadership will be how the Lord intends to change his flock, as he says here, from a flock of sheep into a royal battle horse. He's going to make them mighty and useful and productive in his hand. He's going to make them strong. And he's going to promise them victory. These pictures that he has here of of strength and of stability follow. The picture, a cornerstone is a picture of the foundational strength of what you are building. A tent peg is what holds the materials of the tent together. Things like that. A battle bow obviously is the the uh, the offensive weapon or a, a particularly aggressive offensive weapon and very cool by the way that you could use there and so that kind of thing so you have picture of strength and of stability this is what god is promising particularly in the leadership that he promises to raise up from the house of judah interestingly although according to how the translators have it for us they do not see zechariah directly referencing Messiah. However, we do know that from the house of Judah, Messiah comes. 
from the house of Judah, Messiah comes giving the godliest leadership that is available. He is the one who would come and do this very thing and fight for his people. We know in the end times that lay ahead of us still, he does those very things. And so there is a way in which he is indirectly referenced here, although given how the translators do not capitalize him in verse 4, the him is lowercase in most of your Bibles. And so that's referring to the house of Judah. That's from him, from Judah's house will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, and the rulers over the people. So we have, though, in this picture, easily we can see a great victory for them as promised, treading down their enemies in the streets. That sounds like a pretty, pretty great victory. And it says why they will fight and why they will have such a victory there in the middle of verse 5, last sentence. They're going to fight because the Lord is with them. And they will know that he is with them, and that's why they will go out. Otherwise, if you aren't sure about that, you better not go out. But when you know that he's with you, you have every reason to go out because the Lord is with you. And even this last line there, riders on horses shall be put to shame. That gives a picture of, a superior, again, a superior army that the, that the fighting army of Israel will be able to defeat. The fighting army of Judah will be able to defeat, to defeat a superior army, that which is on horses which is historically always considered to be a superior army. You got more horses, you usually win. And so that's the case there. But even riders on horses will be put to shame, he says, because of the great, the dominating victory pictured here that God promises his people in the future. Verse 6, I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. So, on the one hand, while promising to judge the idolatrous shepherds, God also promises, on the other hand, to have mercy on his people, on his flock. They will not suffer the same judgment. Punishment is coming for idolatrous leadership, but his people won't experience that. They will be as though God had never cast them out in the first place. Right? How much fuller of a restoration experience can you have to be brought back to the exact condition as if it had never happened? No judgment, no captivity, no assaults, no attacking armies, no nothing. It'll be as if none of that stuff ever happened. That is a full 100% restoration back to exactly the way that things are and should have been. Why does he promise to do that and have mercy? Because I am the Lord their God and I will hear them. What does that statement assume about the people. They're calling on God. Isn't that exactly how the chapter started? This particular word from the Lord through Zechariah the prophet, this word called on God's people to call on him, to avoid the idols, to avoid the diviners, to avoid the delusions and lies of paganism and of idolatry. Avoid that. And kind of in this sense here, go around it. If that's how your leaders are going to be, I will deal with them. But you do not have to follow that bad example. You, as my people, can talk directly to me. Call on me, God says. And so from that then, we have him say here as we move through the picture, we have God saying, and I will hear them. Well, you don't hear anybody that's not talking to you. You, Some some sound's got to be heading in your direction for you to hear it. And so he will hear them. They are therefore then calling on him as he said for them to do certainly for the latter rain and the harvest, but for all of the things that God our Father promises to provide. And so the kind of circumventing the bad leadership, which people can always do, especially in a spiritual sense. People can circumvent, people can ignore and avoid bad leadership and still be right in and of themselves, walking with God, talking with the Lord, hearing from Him and having a relationship, even though bad leaders might be sending them, if you were to follow you, if they were, you were... If you were to follow them, you'd go to a bad place because that's where they're headed, right? So that is an important thing that we see here. The people are apparently forsaking the idolatrous ways of their bad shepherds. 
and calling on God as he had said that they should. And just as God delivers on the promise of verse 1, which specifically was for the latter rain and therefore the harvest, just as he promises to deliver on that promise, he will also deliver on this promise. He ties the two things together by saying, I hear them, as well as the strength and saving and restoration of the people now that's promised here. That's just as sure. It's interesting to see that God's people are often shown in the scriptures to need God's rescue from enemies on the outside, especially when you look at national Israel in time past, but certainly God's people generally, they are often shown, depicted in history, as needing God's rescue from an outside threat, a conquering king going by, an attacking army, a foreign army of some kind, uh, whatever it might be that come from the outside, we see that often they need protection from the outside threat. Here, where's the threat? On the inside, right? It's in the house. It's the, the, their own very leaders. It's not an attacking army. It's not a, a besieging force on the outside of the walls of Jerusalem. It's not a, an ambitious conquering king like Alexander the Great. It's none of that outside stuff. It's not nasty neighbors and hostile pagan neighbors that would come against and oppress God's people from time to time. It's not the outside stuff. Sometimes God's people need a rescue from the Lord from bad leaders inside. That is exactly what we are seeing here. Being rescued or the need to be rescued from ungodly leaders over them. His people can, and as we already just said, certainly go around the pagan idolatry of their leaders and cry out directly to the Lord God themselves. They are his people. Because just as he warned them here and many times earlier through other prophets, he warned them as a people to not go after idols. Do not turn your back on the Lord and walk away from his ways. Bad leadership is not a valid excuse for bad living among the people. Not before God, it's not. God, on the one hand, absolutely holds leaders accountable for their influence and their impact on people. Either impacting them in the, in the right and true and wise ways of God or impacting them in the false and wrong ways of the world. But leaders impact people. That's what leading does. To some degree, we know full well from Scripture, bad leaders will answer for all For the condition, in some way, bad leaders will answer to God for all of those that God gave them stewardship authority over and the responsibility to serve and lead well. There is an answering for all leaders. At the same time, however, we remember that Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? If I start to lead you in a way that's not like Christ, You have every reason to not follow that. Don't just follow me because. You know the right thing to do, especially in our day and age. You have a Bible. This is what we go by. And so God's people are also accountable for their own ways as well. And from this sequence in chapter 10, it appears that the people heeded the word from the Lord in verse 1 called on the Lord themselves, avoided the option of idols and diviners who lie and deceive, and cannot do what God can do. As God said in verse 6, I will hear them, or they must be talking to him. So they will call. He has said here, I will have mercy. I will give strength. I will save because I hear them. Additionally, as he has promised before in many places, he will also regather them. Look at verse 8. I will whistle for them and gather them, for I will redeem them. And they shall increase as they once increased. I will sow them among the peoples, and they shall remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children, and they shall return. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will gather them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them. What a cool picture. Overflowing of of returning of the return of God's people. We don't have enough room. For all of these people here. 
It's quite a massive regathering that's pictured in, this, in these verses here until there's no room even in neighboring places. Gilead to the east and Lebanon to the north are outside of where Israel stood nationally back then, and they are both outside of where Israel stands nationally even today. Gilead's on the other side of the Jordan River. That's in the country of Jordan today. Lebanon is Lebanon to the north of Israel. They're outside of national Israel. And so even outside of what they might currently constitute in their land's sake, we're overflowing. We're over into the neighboring areas now. We've already seen from before that the kingdom of Christ is going to take far more land than what national Israel has, a little sliver of land right there. But at any rate, the overflow of the returnees is what's pictured here. We don't have enough room. We're over, over in Gilead, up in Lebanon, and we're running out of room. We certainly know that the Jews nationally, as a, as, as a blood people, Jews, uh, in their nas- in their, in, uh, not spiritually speaking, but nationally, they've certainly experienced a steady and growing regathering over the last few decades. That's been widely seen. That's obvious, and it's an extraordinary and unique thing on the face of the earth. This prophecy, obviously, is speaking of something bigger than even what we've already seen. And certainly, according to prophecy, we know that across the whole face of the earth is coming. In far countries, it says they're going to remember the Lord. From Egypt nearby and from Assyria, which is not particularly nearby, God is going to bring his people back in this overflowing measure. Now, do we think that God merely intends to bring Jews back to Israel to be a political nation? Certainly not. That sells God and his promises far, far short. He has far bigger things planned for them. As prophetically impressive and attention-grabbing as a newly fashioned political national Israel is, as impressive and awesome as that is and unique and and prophecy-highlighting as that is, that's a, a fraction, a tiny fraction of what God has planned for his people in his land in that day to come. So it is, it's far more than just being a political nation. This, that, this is just the, the scraping of the surface of what God is doing prophetically. He intends to bring them home physically and spiritually. Far more important to bring them home spiritually to himself. Zechariah shows that this is the case further down. But we also see that this is the chief part of God's redemption promise repeated throughout his Old Testament promises that are always pointing forward to a new covenant and a restored people and a kingdom to come, but that they are restored not just in a political kingdom or nation, but they are restored to him as a people, relationship-wise. That's always a part of God's redemption promise for his people. And so certainly those things will have a physical reality, but more importantly, they have a spiritual reality. And God spoke of this prophetically long before Zechariah and any of his contemporary prophets, even long before Jeremiah, and even long before Isaiah as well. Back in Deuteronomy 30, through Moses, God laid out the major points of Israel's future related to him their rejection of him, their rebellion against him, their resulting judgment and captivity, their restoration to him, and their spiritual return to him as well. Many of the other prophets laid that out, but Moses laid it out first in Deuteronomy 30, many, many, many centuries before these days. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, this is what Moses said to the people. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. And when you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and when you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. 
He shall prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. Way back, before they were even in the promised land, before they had the era of the judges and then the kings and then the captivity and back now after their captivity and the reconstruction of the temple where Zechariah is now, track that all the way back and God through Moses already laid that out. When you go do this and then you follow it up with that and then you do this, but in that time and no matter your situation on the face of the earth, scattered to the four corners, when you call on me, when you obey me from your heart and call on me and return to me relationally, spiritually speaking, there is going to be this regathering that's described here. Now, is that what preceded the current regathering of a political nation? No. As a people, have they returned to the Lord their God? No, for the most part, Israel is a secular nation. They have a, a, a small fraction of, of, the, of the population there that are orthodox in various ways, that are observant Jews in many ways. But, and even while some are saying that that's a growing number, which we shouldn't be too surprised by, it's still, generally speaking, a secular nation. So they have not returned to the Lord their God and obeyed his voice from their heart. They don't, they don't love the Lord their God with all their heart and soul. So is the current political regathering what's being referred to here? It must not be. Because he said what's going to precede that is you calling on my name. So we have, some, we have as we already stated, a far fuller, far more impressive, far more far-reaching and more spiritually significant regathering that's promised in time to come. We know that that's the case. Zechariah 10 is not the only place where we see that. The New Testament promises the same thing. So yes, in time to come, he will bring them back to the land. But they will be returning to him spiritually as well for the complete fulfillment of what's being described here. Verse 11, speaking again of God, he shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up. Then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. So I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name, says the Lord. There again, very much, especially at the end of verse 12, you have the picture of a relationship being restored, not just a number of people brought back to a political entity. We have small pictures here of, I'm sorry, similar pictures uh, of how God powerfully brought Israel up out of bondage and into the promised land the first time, right? The striking of the sea, the parting of the waters, similar, similar imagery that's being used here, the drying up the river and so on. The power of Assyria, that's Iran today, so that's prophetically interesting. Egypt, Assyria both defeated that which they trust in, that which they hold their power in, totally defeated uh, God has promised. And God will strengthen his redeemed people and they walk up and down. I mean, that's, that's a picture of freedom. That's a picture of safety, protection, to walk up and down, go to and fro, and they're going to do so in his name. Now that far exceeds a political national restoration and does indeed clearly point to a spiritual return. And that, of course, points to nothing other than Messiah's reign. After he returns to the earth, there will be the most extraordinary regathering at the end of this age. Now, before Messiah returns, though, we know that Israel, from other prophecies in the Scriptures, we know that Israel is going to suffer a time of great tribulation and trouble that is directly related to their lack of return to God spiritually through the Lord Jesus Christ yet, and having to do with their rejection of Jesus when he came. So it's the trouble and trial of those last days that will finally position them to repent and return to God in Christ Jesus in preparation for the return of the Lord. And so as we said earlier, there is also a time of judgment that's coming, and the Lord is going to speak of this through Zechariah next in chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, because the mighty trees are ruined. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. There is the sound of wailing shepherds for their glory. 
is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of Jordan is in ruins. So plainly, we have a picture here of of a massive destruction coming upon the land, right? A a crushing down of the forests and, and that particular thing, the forest to the north, the Jordan River Valley to the east, really all mowed down, presumably by a, a marching destructive foreign army, which we'll see that that's the picture uh, as we move through this chapter. The leaders of the people in verse 3 are pictured as wailing, mourning over the coming devastation. Verse 4, Thus says the Lord my God, Feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. So very different from the mercy and redemption promised in chapter 10. Here, the Lord speaks of a different time. We've already said that. Directly, he speaks to Zechariah of a coming slaughter and of no pity. And when attackers will come. You okay? Okay. All right, awesome. Grab a seat up front. God is speaking to Zechariah of a coming slaughter and of a time of no pity, no mercy. Mercy described the time before. Mercy does not describe this other time. When, as it says here, attackers will come against the people of Israel and they will not be delivered. Further down, we're going to see this tied prophetically to their rejection of Jesus Christ. But for now... We have a devastating and destructive attack that's going to be very successful against the people there in the land of Israel. Now, the reason that I said that the Lord speaks directly to Zechariah on this is because the prophet is now going to begin to act out the truth of the prophetic picture. A couple other prophets are well known for having had to do that on a number of occasions. Ezekiel is one who God had him actually act out a number of prophetic pictures and illustrations for the people. Jeremiah was given a number of things to do at different times that had prophetic symbolic meaning for the people. Those are or the two that were told to do so several times acting out God's message. Hosea, famously told by God to marry a harlot, endure her unfaithfulness, and redeem her back to himself. He told him to do that. That was a prophetic acting out, an acted out picture for the people. Isaiah was told to name his children according to God's prophetic word, messages that God had for the people there in prophecies. And so similarly here, Zechariah is given instruction to physically feed a real flock. Go be a shepherd. Go feed a flock in preparation for a slaughter because that's what's coming. It is a slaughter that's coming for the flock because of, as we'll see, their rejection of Christ, their Messiah. Verse 7, so I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them and their soul also abhorred me. So the first picture of God's amazing grace toward his people Israel is here with Zechariah feeding the flock. That's the first thing that he does. This entire demonstration is going to be all of the good that God did for his people. All of the good that God did for them. Followed up by their rejection and God's response. But here you see, again, Zechariah is pictured as he's the shepherd. He's acting as a shepherd. He's acting out God's grace, God's good deeds toward his people. Okay, so feeding the flock. He's feeding the flock. That's what he's doing, especially the poor. Special care for the most needy. Then he makes two staffs and he gives them names. What do those names match? They match God's great love for his people Israel. The first one is called beauty. Also, it means grace. God in his sovereign grace chose them out of all of the peoples of the earth. He chose them to be his people, to love them specially, to give to them particular blessings, particular privileges, and particular responsibilities. But his grace toward them, so there is the grace of God toward them that he would call them to be his sheep, his people, his flock, and he would uh, promise them to be a shepherd to them. And so that's what we have pictured in this first staff that's called beauty. God's beautiful love toward them. 
God also, secondly, with the second staff, he bound them together as one people. Certainly they are bound together as one people from the beginning as 12 tribes, but making up one nation. That was a binding together of the people that God did. And certainly the two houses, remember that the kingdom was split for most of the time after Solomon ruined the kingdom with his idolatry. Hello, idolatry. After he did that, God said, I'm splitting up the kingdom. For David's sake, I'll give you, uh, will, and I, but I won't do it during your life, Solomon, for David's sake. Also for David's sake, I'm going to let your son Solomon stay on the throne of Judah and rule over Jerusalem because I promised David he would always have a son on the throne. But the tribes to the north that, are, that became the northern kingdom of Israel, I'm stripping them away from you and I'm giving them to your servant. So from the time that Jeroboam reigned over Israel and Rehoboam reigned over Judah, the kingdom was split. And yet still, what has God done? He has brought the two houses that were, they even went to war on a number of times against one another. And yet God has done this great thing to bring them together in one nation, one land, one people, his people. And so you have these two staffs that are that picture, God's grace toward them uniquely, God's binding of them together as a people in the staff called bonds. Even in past judgments, God had been faithful to his people and his promises to bring them back together again, including Zechariah's day of restoration and reconstruction. Here they all now are together. But even with all of that, they've not returned to the Lord in repentance and restored relationship and spiritual redemption. And so with all God's grace toward them, and then with their rejection of him, So now judgment is coming, as we're seeing. Just as the rejection of God resulted in judgment before, so also it must again. Verse 9. Then I said, after doing all of these things, right? One more note. His dismissing of the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. This is one that that, uh, explanations for who were the three shepherds that he removed in one month, and what does that mean? Explanations are all over the place. Some have said, though, that the three shepherds are representative of the fact that after God judges them in what we're going to see this described in a minute, after he judges them, which is the Roman destruction of Israel after their rejection of Messiah, okay? After he judges them in 70 AD and and destroys the nation and scatters them again, there are three offices that weren't filled again after that priest and prophet and king. They never again had those. So that's one offering that that seems sensible, but it doesn't matter. We don't need to get into too much about it, but it is an interesting thing that you you read verse 8, and I don't want to just pass it over completely, but I do admit that I don't know what the three shepherds represent. But they're obviously not good, because Zechariah, representing God's goodness in shepherding his people, right? What does he do in this time of blessing his people and feeding them and so on? He kicks these other three shepherds out. You're relieved of your duties. Get out. So they are are bad shepherds in some way over the people. So even that, God's protection over his people when they had bad leaders, time would come eventually, sometimes soon, sometimes not soon, but God would remove those bad leaders. So at any rate, all of the good that God did to provide for and to protect and to bless his people and to show them his special grace and love, right? All right, verse 9. Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die and what is perishing perish. Let those who are left eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff beauty and cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. What does the poor of the flock represent there? Not actual sheep, right? This is a good picture of of a faithful remnant among the people of the Lord there who look at that and see him do what he does, see the prophet act this out and, and have to say amen. You know, they know that this is the word of the Lord. So through Zechariah, God is saying that this time to come, which is an era that we stand in now currently ourselves, is a time when God will no longer deal with his people Israel in spiritual matters as his people. That is not to say that any of his promises about their future restoration spiritually or nationally are voided. They are not voided. They will all be fulfilled. Do not mistake that 
at all, ever, even, a, even a, in the slightest. Don't mistake that. God will do for his people Israel everything that he said he would do for them as a people. Believing Christian Gentiles are only grafted in and should be thankful to be so. Paul makes that very clear. God is going to do all of these great things for his people Israel. That is most of what the prophets spoke of, including Zechariah, is God restoring his people Israel to himself. We've already talked about that here. So there's no voiding of those things. But as far as God's light to the world and the vehicle through which he is intending to reveal himself to the world, that is a way in which God has gone to the Gentiles and set Israel aside for a time. The Gospels make this clear. Jesus talks about it. And Paul talks about it. Jesus mentions this kind of a concept in Luke chapter 4. That is where he begins his earthly ministry. He even reads from the scroll of Isaiah. He reads that this is fulfilled in your hearing. And after that, it says that the people marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. I mean, even when he takes the Isaiah prophecies, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and so on, right? He reads from the Isaiah scroll, applies that to himself to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Closed the book, gave it back. Today, the scriptures fulfilled in your hearing. They didn't have a problem with that at the time, right? They bore witness, it says to him, and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. They're amazed and don't yet have a problem. They do say, is this not Joseph's son? So they're surprised, but they are crediting him with gracious, beautiful words. They're like, wow, this is amazing. Then he says to them, further down, he talks to them about how they're not going to believe this, right? They're going to reject him as the revealed Messiah. And Jesus says, I truly tell you, in verse 25, he references two times in their past. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of those widows was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. That's a Gentile place. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Not a Jew, a Syrian. Then all of those in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath. And rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill and the city was built and they were going to throw him off the cliff. Jesus in another place, uh, just a few chapters later, marvels at the faith of a Gentile centurion. I haven't even found faith like this in Israel, he says. So even Jesus in his ministry begins to make a distinction between the kind of faith in God that God has found among Gentiles versus the kind of faith that he should have found among his people Israel and yet did not. Similarly, you come to the Apostle Paul. To whom was the Apostle Paul sent? His ministry was to the, the Gentiles, right? Peter and John to the Jews, Paul to the Gentiles. The great evangelist, church planter, discipler Paul sent to the Gentiles. All right, in Acts chapter 18 in Corinth, he says to the people there, he goes into the synagogue first, as was his custom. They rejected the gospel, and he says, we're going to the Gentiles, right? Your blood will be on your own head. We're going to the Gentiles. Later in Acts chapter 22, Paul's in Jerusalem after almost getting torn to shreds, and he's speaking to the mob that almost killed him there, and he says there, he recounts how God saved him, right? And God, Paul tells them that near the end, Paul said, or that uh, Paul tells them that God told him, depart from here and go to the Gentiles. And it even says there that people listened intently to Paul until he got to that point. He had even already told them that Jesus rose from the dead, appeared to him, talked to him, and gave him ministry to preach the gospel. They didn't respond to that. But when he said, and God told me to get out of here and go to the Gentiles, they're not going to hear you, he says. Go to the Gentiles. They throw, they scream and yell, throw dirt in the air, tear their clothes. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's an immediate riot. In Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul discusses the majesty, the unsearchable riches of God's wisdom and knowledge and his majestic will in that God, in God's great wisdom, he chose to work through the Jews to reveal himself to the world 
specifically through the coming of Messiah, then yet in the Jews' rejection of God in Christ, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now he's working through the Gentile world in that way. Paul even says God's doing this to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Go, wait a second. He's our God. That they would then return. And their state of rejection of God, Paul says, is not final. God's state of rejection of them, he says, is not final. God is not done. He's going to do all the stuff he said. God is working both of those things into his glorious to demonstrate his mercy on everyone. It's an amazing thing. So God's not done yet. At least take that home. Now, why do we so confidently, though, tie what's being prophesied here to their rejection of Jesus as Messiah and then the judgment that God sent upon them by way of the Roman army after that? Verse 12. Then I said to them, this is Zechariah talking, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. And so I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now, in the law, in Exodus 21, it tells us there that the value of a slave was considered to be 30 pieces of silver. The law that's described there, if, if by accident you accidentally kill a slave that belongs to somebody else, then you are to pay that person 30 pieces of silver. That was the price for them to go be able and replace that slave. So that was the price of a slave, all right? 30 pieces of silver, which Zechariah sarcastically calls the princely price they set on me. Oh, thank you so much for valuing me so highly. 30 pieces of silver. So it's an idea here of him saying, go ahead, show me what you think I'm worth. I'm prophesying, I'm acting this whole thing out for you. I'm communicating to you the word of the Lord. Show me what that's worth to you. Show me what that's, what's the value of me doing this. This points forward, obviously, you already know. Matthew 27 makes it plain for us. This is Judas. This, and Matthew tells us that this is a fulfillment of these words, right? Judas betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. He realizes that Jesus is condemned in Matthew 27. Uh, Judas goes back to the religious leaders. He says, hey, you know, this, this is all bad. This is, this is not what I wanted, paraphrasing. And they say, you know, deal with it yourself. We're, we're, we're not helping you do anything. This is what we wanted. So he throws the 30 pieces into the temple, right? And what do they do with it? They take it and they go by the potter's field. The potter's field where rejected, broken, damaged pottery and clay stuff. You know, you're making your thing. It gets all wobbly on the wheel and oh, it's all messed up. Well, you toss it over there. That's where that stuff goes. They eventually buried the dead people there who, didn't ha- who were who were nameless people who weren't valuable. They would bury them in that place and so on. And so for for a place that was considered the place for damaged, worthless stuff or damaged, worthless people, that was purchased for the price of one person or one slave. So at any rate, you have that whole picture there. Matthew makes plain that what Judas did, what happened to him, what was purchased with the 30 pieces of silver is in great detail a prophetic, the prophetic fulfillment of what God told Zechariah to do back here. So it's a clear prophetic fulfillment of God's word. Therefore, we connect the rejection of Jesus Christ, which is what the betrayal of Judas purchased, right? The rejection of Jesus Christ, we connect that to the prophetic picture of what Zechariah is communicating regarding the coming judgment of Israel because of that rejection. Verse 14, Then I cut into my other staff bonds, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So the beauty or grace staff is already broken. Now the bond staff is broken, breaking up the unity of the nation of Israel. This is seen in what? Well, when the Romans come and destroy the nation of Israel, there they are scattered all over the place again. So they're not unified. Now they're scattered all over the face of the earth. And as we said earlier, even now they're beginning to regather this return that's going on. Jesus even foresaw that judgment Right when he wept over Jerusalem because they didn't recognize their day. The prophesied day, according to Daniel 9, and the prophesied way in which Messiah would reveal himself, which is Zechariah's prophecy from Zechariah 9. So all of these things now are tied together 
of this judgment that's promised to come, namely because of the future rejection of Jesus Christ as Messiah, as far as Zechariah's time frame is concerned. Verse 15. And the Lord said to me, Next take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd, for indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that stay... Uh, that still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. So talk about a, a destructive tyrant and a dictator, this kind of, of leader, a shepherd, a leader that's going to be raised up for God's purposes. God's going to raise up this individual for his purposes. So through Zechariah's actions after this, God is communicating this to them, a leader that they brought upon themselves because of the foolish rejection of Jesus as the Christ. So they get a foolish shepherd for it. Not just the destruction, but eventually a foolish shepherd. So clearly in the timeline, we're jumping way ahead, right? We see all the good shepherd traits that this one guy will not have. Not seek those that are cut off to bring them back. Not seek the young to nurture them. Not seek the heal, uh, the broken to heal them. Not feed those who are around. All the opposites of what a good shepherd does. Okay, so that's this guy, verse 19. Yet... Even though God says, I'm raising him up and he's going to serve God's sovereign purposes in prophecy, still, verse 19, woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. What did I say? Why would I say that? There's no 19. So if you look for it, I have misled you. I'm a bad shepherd. Don't look for a verse 19 in this chapter. Look for a verse 17 and then you'll be where I'm reading. <laughs> Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock and tells them wrong numbers. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. All right, so looking ahead, this is a particular individual, the worthless shepherd that's being prophesied about. There we have Antichrist pictured at the end of the age, raising up as this one particular leader prophecy tells us Israel as a, as a people like most of the world is going to embrace this guy. They'll actually embrace him as Messiah only until he reveals himself to very much be not that guy, right? We see a description of him in Revelation 13 that even matches the fact that he's going to be wounded, right? So that's an interesting prophecy. You can look that up for yourselves due to time. We do need to say that this is something that sometimes gives us a, a prophetic headache. That just because God appoints a foolish shepherd and God raises him up to accomplish God's purposes of judgment, that never means that God approves of a foolish or godless leader. He just uses them for his own glory. He uses pagan kings. He uses anybody he wants. He gave them Saul as their first king. Not because Saul was awesome either. Saul was a picture of what you, what you are. You've demanded a king like other nations, then you're going to get a king like other nations. And Saul ended up a king just like other nations. Consulting a witch, going after, you know, doubting God, disobeying the God of Israel, so on and so forth. After that, he provides a shepherd king in David, right? And then the son of David, Messiah, is the good shepherd and king. So we have these neat lines in prophecy that we can track forward. Prophecies like this and that which still lies ahead of us in Zechariah ought to further ground us in the urgency with which we to, uh, are to live our lives today. Great deception accompanies the end times. Great deception accompanies the coming of the Antichrist. A great lack of a love of the truth accompanies, characterizes the end times. There is a way in which many will be swept away and there's, in one sense, nothing prophetically we can do about that because it's going to happen. But that doesn't give us the right to not evangelize, not live out the gospel, not minister to people, not serve the Lord. So just as God does not excuse God, uh, ungodly leadership even when it serves his purposes, he also doesn't excuse laziness on the part of Christians just because these things are going to happen. Like, well, you know, what are you going to do? Well, you can't stop it from happening, true. But in your time and in our time and in our circle and in our place here among the people God's blessed us with, especially if you have leadership, stewardship authority, be mindful. Be mindful of the impact that you have on people for Jesus' namesake. Let's pray.
Father, we trust you when you have given us your word and we ask that you would bring all things to pass as you have foresaid. We pray, Lord, that you would give us strength and endurance and wisdom according to your word and according to the times in which we live. Make us wise and fruitful, serving you well until the end. As we sang, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.